Hello. Five best ways to get the bank approval you're looking for. And that's a thing. Maybe you want to buy a house, a car, or open a business, or whatever you want to do. Well, joining us in our Joburg studio is Samke, Sam as we call you, Sam mm-hmm. and Gwenya, private banker and personal finance consultant. Welcome back to The Money Show. All right. Nice to be back. Great to have you on. Now, right. Why get the approval you're looking for? What What should you look out for? Right. I want to go and buy that, that car or that house. What should I do? So basically, I think this is just to help you plan for it because um, simply making that application at the time of the transaction may not uh, get you the best deal for you, the best rate for you. And remember, once you're stuck in a five-year car financing deal or a 20-year, 30-year vehicle financing deal, it will be very difficult to get it restructured, if at all. So you want to make sure that you are putting yourself in a position to get the best deal from the onset. Let's go through them now. Okay, the right debt to income ratio for you. In, in, in fact, before you continue, if you have any questions you would like to ask Sam, 021-446-0567-011-883-0702. I recommend you do pick her brain because she knows exactly what she's doing. You see, I'm vouch for you. <laughs> But let's go back to the right debt to income ratio for you. Yes, I always get very surprised when clients say to me, um, I'm good for credit, that's three times my earnings, right? No, there's no such ratio or ruling that applies. What you want to do is to make sure that when you look at your earnings trajectory, you're sitting at a good debt to income ratio. So what I mean by that is if you are younger, if you're earlier on in your life cycle, you know that your earnings trajectory is quite steep. You're going to be making a lot of money in the, in the near future. So you can tend to be a bit aggressive in terms of taking out debt relative to your earnings. But surely if you, sorry, surely if you earn, say, for instance, 100000 rand a month Mm -hmm. that qualifies you for huge credit not necessarily if you're earning a hundred thousand rand a month are you a package of 1.2 million per annum Mm -hmm. and you are sort of 50 years old you know the assumption is that you've almost peaked in terms of your earnings you don't want to at that age and in terms of your life cycle be taking out debt aggressively you should actually be in a position where you are paying off debt if you still have any and actually be in a position where you are aggressively saving or putting towards your retirement now if you're on a package of 1.2 million rand per annum at 30 years old for instance if you're fortunate enough to be in that position you can be more aggressive in terms of taking out debt to to fund i would say your good assets being your 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 property or any appreciating assets investing um, and you can be quite aggressive in terms of your Gearing. So the ratio you want to look for is a ratio that is comfortable enough for you to repay in time for you to be able to put monies away for your retirement and cater for you when you're not in a position to be earning an income. You see, that's the big thing. Also, then number two, have a clear, verifiable history of earnings. And that's, yes. that's the thing you actually have to, I suppose, leave a paper trail for yourself. Absolutely. Now, this is, a not, this is not a conversation that will mean much for people that have a payslip because that's easy. Submit three months payslips, three months bank statements, you're done. This is more for those individuals that are self-employed or are consulting or are commission earners where your income is either lumpy or erratic. You want to make sure that you have given yourself at least sort of 12 months Plus, in terms of a pattern where the bank can establish a pattern of a worst case scenario uh, range of earnings, and that'll help you um, create uh, get the best deal for yourself. So, for instance, if you are recently self employed, you've only been self employed maybe for for a month or two, you're no longer on a pay slip. The credit for you will be much more difficult than someone who's been employed, let's say, for self-employed for 12 months, and they've been paying themselves consistently monthly. We can see in the in the bank statements. There's an amount coming in like clockwork at the same time. We can match that amount back to your tax returns. We can match those tax returns back to your company financials. If that matches up, you've got a greater chance of having a a better approval for you and a better rate. That's interesting. So pay yourself a salary then. Yes. So a lot of my uh, self-employed clients will say, no, um, I, I take out the minimum. Well, then I can only lend you against the minimum that you are taking out in your personal capacity, you see? Mm. Now, what about tax? Because I know a lot of people listen to the show and I think, right, I don't earn anything, so therefore I don't have to pay tax. But that's a <laughs> bit of a problem, isn't it, if you want credit? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we do get audited in terms of the uh, credit applications uh, that we approve and in terms of the amounts that we advance. We don't want to be seen as being reckless lenders. So, um, you know, our applications are vetted. So if you are saying to me that, you know what, on paper or per my tax returns, I make 
10,000 rand a month, but your lifestyle says something else, or verbally you tell me that you, 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 you make much more than that, I can only go with what's verifiable. Hence that word, verifiable history of earnings. And that's how the taxman makes sure that um, you don't engage in that lovely term, tax avoidance, which I heard on 702 oh, a couple of weeks avoision. ago. Tax avoidance, where your tax avoidance techniques are so sophisticated, they tend to see evasion. Oh. They just blur that line. So if you're going to under declare your earnings, then unfortunately, your credit facilities that uh, the banks grant you will be in line with what you're declaring. The banks are very clever, aren't they? Because if you want to borrow some money, they can just push one little button and they'll find out exactly what income you're earning and who you owe to as well. Absolutely. So we may not always know all the income you're earning because, I mean, there are very sophisticated ways of, of in fact, some unsophisticated ways, i.e. cash transactions. We'll, if it doesn't enter the banking system, we've got no trace of it. But um, in terms of who you owe what, do not lie to your bank. There's that lovely report called TransUnion ITC. I see exactly who you owe, how much you're in arrears and whether you're paying or not. So don't lie to me. Simple as that. Because you always get these guys phoning up and say, now, how much do you uh, spend on groceries? And you say 200 rand. <laughs> the guy goes, yeah, right. Okay. Send it right and writes that down but you get caught out don't you you get caught out and um you know your your credit repayments that's where we can see with certainty now where individuals had scope okay to under declare the expenses was in terms of your discretionary spend like clothing um education food and what the nca amendment of um that came into effect last year april i think i stand to be connected uh, corrected, said that there are deemed minimum expenses. So if you say that you only spend a thousand rand on food for a family of four, mm-hmm. the NCA will say, you know what, in terms of these earnings and in terms of the dependence this person has, that's not uh, reasonable. The deemed minimum is 3,000 rand, and that's the figure we need to use as the financial. Um, yeah. institutions. So be honest, because I know in the, in, in the bad old days, you actually had to fill that form in and you were fine. You were okay, but uh, they've got your number. We rounded time. down <laughs> quite okay. generously. Now, take a run up to the application. I love this. that. That's uh, point <laughs> number three of five best ways to get the bank approval you're looking for. Take a run up to the application. Tell us yeah. more about that. So um, if you know that you're going to be applying for credit, um, you obviously want to be in a position where your credit score and your credit history is shining, for lack of a better word. Now, I won't get into the ins and outs of how you can improve your credit score or your credit history because I know that you had the lady from TransUnion about a week ago, two weeks ago. But what you want to do is give yourself enough time to improve that and to get the best credit score for yourself. So um, as banks and financial uh, credit providers, we do look at a 24-month history. So so don't wake up one weekend to decide you like a house, you sign an offer to purchase and off you're going to go to the bank when you haven't actually checked what your credit profile looks like. So uh, plan ahead and make sure that your, your your conduct, your credit conduct up to the stage at which you want to make that application is, is prudent and holds you in the best light. And by so doing, actually, you'll actually be putting yourself in a position where you can actually get a feel for, for what it will be like to actually meet all your obligations. Are you in a position to meet all your monthly obligations on time? Are you in a position to be, to be taking out extra or additional credit? The, the National Credit Act, about five years ago, ten years ago, they, they, they became very strict with it. And you couldn't get finance. And I, a lot of first-time homeowners actually complained about it, saying, well, we can't get credit. Things just seem to have relaxed a little bit, though. Um, not necessarily, I don't think. I think it was just a shock to the system at the time because uh, the lending practices in the country were quite lax. And uh, in fact, the reason why the regulator started increasing regulations around the credit extension processes was because, you know, South Africans were getting hugely over indebted. We know that South African households even today are hugely over indebted. And so uh, I think it was an initial shock to the system. Um, if anything, regulation has been tightening over time and uh, especially in the current economic climate, we as financial instit- uh, financial providers, we are being quite prudent and you can see that with the decline in uh, credit extensions as well. Mm. Question here, yeah, SMS credit, do banks need a consumer's consent to access your credit profile? Nedbank says it does not need consent. So that's from Rudzani. We absolutely need your consent before we can access your credit profile. So um, just be careful in terms of any online applications you make or any forms you, 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 you fill out because usually those will include a clause that says that by signing this or completing this, you are giving us the authority to run a credit check on you. Okay, simple as that. So they do need to ask, uh, ask your permission. Let's take some calls now. Let's go to Linda in Cape Town. Hi, Linda. 
Hi. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask, um, I applied for a student loan for my son last year. In the end, I decided to rather just borrow the money from my um, structured facility, my home loan. Um, but it was actually declined. And the amount that I had applied for, I thought they would take into account my salary, which I've been at the same company for years, as well as my income, my rental income on a property that I own. And the reason they said it was declined was because they only took into account my salary, not my rental income. And I just wanted to ask about that. What is the reason? Does that make sense? Why do they not take into account rental income? A lot of people have got second properties where they're earning money from them. Mm, Good question. Sam? Thanks, Linda. Okay. So in terms of your salary, your salary is guaranteed to you. At the end of the month, you're getting that specific amount in your bank account. Now, with regards to rental income, you are relying on a third-party individual. That individual, if they don't have the money to pay you, um, you know, will carry on staying in your house. There are very strict and tight laws around um, tenant eviction. So you may go a number of months where you've got no recourse to an individual staying in your house without paying you. So rental income is not guaranteed. If it is a corporate rental, i.e. you are renting out to a company, a big multinational or the embassy, you know that whether there's a tenant in that house or not, in that property or not, if they've signed a three-year lease agreement with you, for three years you're getting your money like a clockwork. So banks tend to be more accommodating of that. But if you are relying on a third-party individual that we as the banks have no sight of, we don't know what their repayment profile is like, um, there'll be there'll be a long lead time between evicting a tenant and getting a new one in, that income is not guaranteed. And the National Credit Act says we cannot lend against income that is not guaranteed. It's as simple as that. There we go. Okay. I mean, mine was in fact a corporate rental uh, with, a, with a multinational, but I didn't pursue it in the end. But it's good to know that if I needed to, I could actually, then that may change the bank's mind in terms of my the amount of credit they'd lend me. Yeah, so I would encourage you um, next time you're in that position to just provide a copy of that agreement and to understand what the bank's policy is on lending against rental income. Remember that the bank still does have the discretion to not take that into account um, or uh, has a discretion to, to decide on what haircut to apply to that rental income. So you'll never, a bank will never lend one to one in terms of the rental income, mm. but maybe at 50%, 20%, but definitely um, challenge the response you're getting and have an understanding of why they will not take that rental income into account if they if they say they won't. Linda, in Cape Town, I hope that uh, makes a little bit of sense to you. Uh, talk about the five best ways to get the bank's approval that you're looking for. In other words, the best deal from the bank. See us on the money show. We uh, look after you. Talking about the five best ways to get the bank to approve that loan you want them to. And uh, in studio guest is uh, Samke, Sam Gwenya, private banker and personal finance consultant. Now, Sam, here's a very interesting one. Ray, does the bank take into account 100% rental, assuming you owe nothing on that property from Sadia in Sunning Hills? So you owe nothing on it. So therefore, that rental's still coming in. They're still going to say it's just rental, aren't they? Well, how does you owing or not on your bond um, affect the tenant's ability to repay or make payment on their end? Mm, yeah, so there we go. Sorry about that, Sadia, but <laughs> nope. No, no, no. All right. So number four out of the five best ways to get that uh, bank approval that you want. Bargain. You see, that's the thing. <laughs> Us South Africans, oh, wow. Standard Bank said, yes, I'll take it. Bargain, yes? Yes. I may be putting my job on the line here, but bargain. You know, <laughs> in terms of the fees, your if you're speaking home loans, your bond registration fees, your valuation fees, or any fees you aren't sure of, question and bargain and see if you can negotiate. Um, bargain the termination clause. Bargain the conditions of your approval. Bargain whether you can fix your rate and at what rate can you fix. So as soon as a, a, um, a credit application is approved for your grant to you, just see if it suits you. And if it doesn't, take a chance and bargain. Banks are open to bargaining. Now, obviously, how desperate you are for the cash may limit your negotiation power. But I'd say if there isn't at least one clause you'd like to question, amend or omit, then you haven't read your agreement closely enough. Just mm. find some, just read through it carefully and make sure you're comfortable with every single line item. If you're not, question. And if the person you're questioning cannot explain it to you like you're a five-year-old, then they don't know what they're talking about. So the... The bottom line is the banks really want your business, so maybe they'll fight over you. I know when I buy a car, and it is on HP because most of us do that, and then they say, no, no, don't worry, we'll speak to Ned Bank. No, no, the Santa Bank said yes, and then, oh, Absa, they're great, that kind of thing. Just, mm. just negotiate. Negotiate, find out, question. You've got every right to. If anyone questions you, tell them, said, tell them Sam said you can bargain and you can question. Sam said. <laughs>
I like it. It's like, like, like John Robbie. Tell him I sent you. <laughs> Good stuff. Number five, create equity that is rolled, grown over time. Yes. So you want to close the loop because, um, you know, once you've got that home loan you want, that vehicle finance you want, you almost get stuck in a cycle where you're always on the back foot. So pay down the assets that you've taken out financing for, you know, assuming obviously that the financing is for, is, is for the purchase or acquisition of assets. And, um, an access facility or a drawdown facility on a home is cheap funding. So when you're looking at buying that second property, for instance, consider drawing down on your existing home loan to use as a deposit on the new property. Because remember, the bigger the deposit, the better the rates we will give you. There we go. He says that. And uh, Leah Miso. Hi, Leah Miso. Welcome to the show. Oh. Now, you, don't want to, you want to talk about starting a business. Go for it. Good evening. Uh, good evening uh, to you, Ray and Sam. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, um, I want to venture into a business for uh, transportation, so I'll be rendering services to the other company. Now, this company will give me a three-year contract, but basically, before I come with the vehicles, they will just give me the, an appointment letter that uh, they are guaranteed that they will have rendered to service to them for three years. So I'm asking uh, whether the bank will be able to ask me only with uh, the appointment letter. And I, I, uh, this is like, a, I don't have any business. It will be the first time I went to okay. That's a very good question, Liamie. So mm-hmm. thanks very much for your call. That really is a really good question. Sir. Thank you, Liamie. So um, in fact, you know, the access to credit for entrepreneurs is such a topical issue right now. And, um, you know, banks differ in terms of their credit, in terms of their appetite you know in advancing credit now it would deter- it would depend on the conditions included in your appointment letter because if your appointment letter has uh, caveats in terms of this is you you are uh, employed on condition or we will pay you on condition that you meet one two three four five if there's any scope that you will not receive remuneration or payment then that poses a risk for us you know, so um, I don't know how successful you will be mm. in being advanced credit simply on an appointment letter, even on tenders, you know, because there is ter- there are terms and conditions that go along with you receiving your payment. And if you don't comply or deliver the goods or the services in line with the, the, the caveats and the conditions included in the agreement, then the agreement does not hold. Simple as that. We are out of time, I'm afraid. No. Why are we always out of time, you and I? <laughs> Sam Gwen, you are a private banker and personal finance consultant. Very quickly, your website address? Uh, or Twitter. T- or Twitter? Samke, S for sugar, A, mother, K, E, underscore, Nguenya. Or um, you can check me out on LinkedIn because I publish a couple of articles as well. Like this one as well, I've put out an article, just a summary of the points discussed on my LinkedIn page. Happy that you join me on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter. Great to have you in the studio.